In this lecture on the foundations and current applications of resilience theory, Dr. Steve Carpenter overviews the major concepts and historical evolution of resilience thinking. He explains that resilience theory came out of an understanding of adaptive cycles, which have a stable front loop where changes are small or non-critical, and a chaotic back loop where an accumulation of change eventually pushes a system to a tipping point and reorganization. He uses an example from a scenario planning project in northern Wisconsin to highlight the need to identify potential critical transitions and back loops before they occur, in order to build capacity in human systems to deal with uncertainty. He also highlights current thinking and writing from younger resilience scholars, which focuses on concepts and methods to better understand complex adaptive systems. These include maintaining heterogeneity and connectivity, broadening participation, and identifying slow variables to help manage the state of the system. He concludes by noting that more work needs to be done in characterizing the back loops of systemic change and highlights the use of scenarios and models to explore these changes before they occur. I was asked to talk about uh, theory and uh, I had a, a lot of fun trying to think about how to talk about it. And uh, in the end, I decided to just tell you about my conceptions of social ecological systems as they evolved over the last uh, 20 or so years. So I'm gonna, uh, for me, this started with a project called the Resilience Network a little over 20 years ago, and I'm gonna give you a, a very quick history of resilience thinking for social ecological systems. Um, I also have collaborated with econo economists, and uh, economics uh, uh, offers uh, some particular tools for thinking about SES, and I want to talk about those a little bit. There is a component of resilience thinking called the back loop, which I'll explain momentarily, which I think actually, it, thinking about the back loop, I think is really the center uh, of the mysteries of understanding social ecological systems. Um, I want to give you a current synthesis uh, that I was not involved in by a group called the Rays, which I think is uh, having a huge influence in resilience thinking right now and is dominating uh, a lot of uh, the work that is going on around the world on uh, resilience, so I want to just talk about that a little bit. Um, and then uh, close with a few comments about field testing <coughs> ideas, which I will uh, continue tomorrow. So first, brief history of, of resilience. So um, in, in uh, the mid-90s, Buzz Holling, who uh, actually developed many of the ideas about resilience in a seminal 1986 paper, uh, organized a group called the Resilience Network, which was a, uh, a, an interdisciplinary group of about 20 people that he brought together for a series of meetings to think about uh, um, uh, concepts of change in social ecological systems. And uh, the photos here show uh, five people from uh, that network, and uh, I could have picked any of, of the 20, I suppose, but uh, the, these are the five whose ideas I borrowed for uh, the talk that I'm about to give you. So I, I wanted to give them uh, some, some credit, and I, I've learned a, a lot from uh, uh, many meetings over many years and from my friendships with, uh, with those, those five people. So the basic idea of, uh, 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 of resilience, as we conceived it in, in uh, the mid-90s, was that there are two phases of change. There's a sort of a, a routine uh, change uh, that uh, we call the for loop or the front loop. Uh, the front loop moves from a growth phase, uh, <laughs> uh, nicknamed R for the famous logistic equation of population ecology, to a conservation phase. Uh, which we nicknamed the K phase, again, uh, by allusion to, uh, to population ecology. And uh, uh, there are many models for routine change as a system develops, as plants colonize a new substrate, as a new business develops, uh, as a new organization is, is formed. There's also a phase of change that's very turbulent and uh, complex and not so easy to understand. We call that the back loop. 
The back loop begins with a collapse of a highly developed system which releases resources in some form, maybe money, but maybe nutrients or carbon or, or space or whatever. Uh, and uh, then eventually that leads to a reorganization that starts a new for loop. So the contrast between routine change or the front loop and turbulent change or the back loop is, uh, is, is fundamental. So you put it all together, it's something called uh, the adaptive cycle and that was the basic unit of change that we uh, were using to organize our thinking in, uh, in, in the mid 90s. Uh, an example from Ecosystems is forest fire, so uh, at the beginning you have young trees and open canopy, essentially no fuel. After a few hundred years, you have a forest of old trees, a closed canopy, lots of dead trees on the ground, lots of branches, a lot of fuel lying around. Eventually there may be a fire. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and the site is uh, barren for a while, but eventually a reorganization begins, and that can come from sprouts of uh, roots, from rootstocks of plants that were there before, from seed input, seed rain from neighboring sites, any number of uh, uh, sites. So ecological succession is a uh, uh, kind of a simple example you can think about uh, uh, to remember the adaptive cycle. Of course, ecosystems are also organized hierarchically in space and time. This is a plot of the log of the space of a process versus the log of its turnover time in years. This is called a Stommel diagram after uh, the oceanographer Henry Stommel who introduced these in um, the 1930s to think about turbulence and pattern in the ocean. And since then they become fairly popular uh, in ecology and it's easy in ecological textbooks to find lots of diagrams that show that uh, systems are organized hierarchically in space and time. For example, the green one is a forest, uh, the smallest scale of needles, tree crowns, a patch of trees, a stand of trees, which is a larger unit, a forest itself, and a whole landscape uh, composed of a heterogeneous mosaic of forests. Um, the social scientists that we worked with in uh, uh, the mid-90s very quickly pointed out that uh, similar sorts of space-time hierarchies could be identified in social systems. So uh, uh, scaling in uh, terms of number of people and the persistence time of an entity uh, uh, is potentially useful for thinking about social systems. So. Uh, uh, this led to uh, uh, an elaboration of the adaptive cycle called the panarchy, so you can imagine multiple adaptive cycles at different spatial extents and turnover times, and they can be connected in various ways. Two of the kinds of connections that are particularly important are the revolt and remember connections. Anyone who has raised children will be very familiar with these, where uh, the uh, smaller scale uh, entity at critical moments of collapse is actually able to induce catastrophic change in the larger scale entity through a, uh, uh, a, a spread, a contagious spread of the uh, stresses. Um, and on the other hand, during the reorganization phase of the smaller scale entity, elements of structure that are present at a larger scale may be remembered and influence that, uh, uh, that, that reorganization. Uh, going back to the forest, the seed rain on a site uh, may in fact be uh, uh, produced from a much larger spatial scale and, and essentially that's an aspect of remembrance. So, so these were uh, the basic ideas that we worked with. And um, looking back on it, I think our biggest success with these ideas was the work that Francis Wesley did on change in organizations. And Francis organized a series of workshops uh, around the world with environmental NGOs, um, uh, working uh, with, uh, with those NGOs to understand change in their environments and change in their organizations using ideas of the adaptive 
adaptive cycle and panarchy. And I, I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, be one of the uh, uh, teachers in in a couple of of, of those workshops. And here's Francis uh, leading a workshop in in Uruguay uh, last last year. And and one of the things we learned. Uh, uh, through Francis in this work with organizations is what it feels like to be in an organization going through uh, the, the different uh, phases. So in the growth phase, people have converged on an approach or a process, a product, a question, an intellectual agenda in a uh, science. Um, uh, the kinds of people that are involved are people who are implementers, organizers, team builders, engineers. It's an exciting time, uh, a time of flow, high energy, learning is rapid, there's a, there's a sense of progress. As you move into the conservation phase, uh, the system is near its peak production. Uh, in, in a science, this is the feeling like, wow, I'm having a hard time thinking of interesting questions in this area. I think I'll go work on something else now. Um, progress seems to be incremental. Uh, uh, engineers and managers do well. People who enjoy engineering and management uh, uh, do well in this phase. Innovators might be a little bit bored and looking around for something else to do. There is an experience of satisfaction, pride of uh, accomplishment, uh, anxiety about, about uh, stresses on the system and the system losing uh, momentum. So it's a, a kind of conflicted feelings. Uh, in that sense. Uh, eventually that transitions to, to a release because there will be a discontinuation or a breakdown of key processes in a business. A competitor might come in with a better product. Uh, in government, there may be a shift in the electorate, a shift in the mood uh, of the electorate, and uh, maybe very different kinds of politicians are, uh, are beginning to get the, the uh, votes. In science, uh, people may vote with their feet, and they may, may just decide, well, this old uh, research agenda is something I'm not interested in anymore. I'm going to shift my intellectual energy and support uh, into something else. Um, people who thrive on crisis are very excited uh, and engaged by this phase, uh, and people who uh, miss the old way will mourn the loss. So it's a time of anxiety, changing relationships, uh, uh, can be a lot of confusion uh, in, in the organization. During the reorganization phase, there's a, re a recognition that there is a need for innovation and a need for doing something else. There is a, 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 it's a time of meandering, loss of focus, experiments that may have few measurable outcomes for some time, but also it's a time of deepening mysteries and, and those can evoke uh, excitement in, uh, in, in science. People who love to play with uncertainty are happy here. Entrepreneurs, innovators, and I think researchers, actually. I, I, I think for many researchers, at least for me, that's I'm happiest in, uh, in, in that phase of, of reorganization. Lots of false starts, frustration. Occasionally you figure something out, and eventually it leads to a new growth phase. Um, at about the same time Francis was running <clears throat> those workshops and I was occasionally participating, I uh, uh, developed a collaboration with an economist and a mathematician, um, uh, William Brock, who is on your right, is a mathematical economist at UW-Madison. Uh, Don Ludwig on the left is a mathematician from University of British Columbia. And at the time we did the work, um, notions of uh, of alternate states, which are pretty prominent in ecology, had not really penetrated economics. And we felt that traditional economic benefit cost analyses were really missing something uh, by not considering uh, alternate states. Um, so we wrote a series of papers on the economic implications of alternate states. We used eutrophic lakes as our uh, lab rat for those uh, 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 modeling studies because uh, I had a lot of data on eutrophic lakes uh, available for calibrating models. So the basic idea is lakes have clear and turbid water states. 
Phosphorus inputs uh, are typically the driver that is most likely to shift them to the turbid state. Phosphorus washes in from the landscape. It comes from excessive use of fertilizer or uh, 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 excessive production of manure in the dairy state that I, that I come from. The phosphorus ends up in the lakes, builds up in the sediments, eventually can tip the lake into an alternate state where uh, there are high algae concentrations all the time, uh, toxic blooms of cyanobacteria and other kinds of problems. So we were studying the economics of that rapid transition. And um, quickly summarizing three very long papers, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the general pattern is that optimal policies, uh, economically optimal policies in a benefit cost sense, often add just enough pollutant to barely avoid crossing the threshold. And eventually something random happens and you cross the threshold. So a lesson of the models is that mistakes are almost inevitable due to uncertainties and random events in the environment and back loops are therefore gonna happen. Even in, a, uh, uh, even in a system that you are trying to control with the best available uh, information. We then embedded that analysis in a series of much more complex models of social ecological systems working with a uh, very skilled computer programmer named Paul Hansen at the Center for Limnology. And in all of these models, there were uh, agents, which are essentially individuals, say individual farmers or recreators or landowners or whatever, making decisions based on uh, rational beliefs and and the information that's available to them in the model. So there are hundreds of these uh, computer people running around in silico. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, nonlinear ecosystem dynamics are responding to human action and are, uh, and are measured imperfectly by the agents and the regulators. And all of these models produce some sort of looping structure like you, uh, like, like you see here with, um, um, uh, uh, you know, times of collapse as you see here in the back of the figure and, uh, uh, and then these meandering uh, periods of growth that you see in, uh, uh, in the front of the figure and if you squint those look a little bit like the adaptive uh, cycle. Um, as, as a result of this work, we really began to center our thinking on, uh, on the back loop. It seemed like we had pretty good models for normal development and growth. Ecologists and social scientists had been thinking about that for uh, a, a long time, and, and, and we had a lot of information to go on. It was this... Uh, uh, the dynamics of collapse and the dynamics of recovery and reorganization following collapse that we had a poor understanding of actually both in, in ecosystems and in, uh, uh, in, in social systems. So our, our initial thinking uh, about, and these are the kinds of things we would talk about in, in workshops uh, in the early 2000s, were things like protect the wisdom uh, uh, that you're, uh, the experience that you're gonna need to make wise choices. In other words, basically protect the memory that you need to, to reorganize. Um, experiment, uh, but not in a dangerous and potentially catastrophic way. So try to find safe options for experiments, uh, scales or uh, modes of experimentation, where if it fails, it's okay. But if it works, maybe there's a big uh, payoff. Um, build capacity for adaptation and talk a lot about complexity. Uh, expand and communicate an understanding of, of, of change. Try to uh, uh, get uh, a lot of people and diverse people thinking about the complex problem that the uh, system faces. Um, about that time, I got interested in an approach called scenarios, which I'll talk about more tomorrow. Scenarios are just one of many ways of organizing thinking in uh, the back loop. Uh, 
Um, uh, uh, scenarios have many definitions. I'm using a very particular definition. I mean a set of plausible stories. It can't be just one. You need multiple stories about how the future of a social ecological system might unfold from existing patterns, new factors, and human volition, alternative choices that people may make. And Paul Raskin is one of the pioneers of scenario thinking. He did uh, marvelous work at Stockholm uh, Environment Institute in the mid-90s on uh, scenarios, and he wrote an overview paper of uh, the state of the art of scenarios in ecosystems in 2005, from which I'm I'm taking that definition. And, I, and uh, in my talk tomorrow, especially, I'll give you more concrete examples of uh, uh, scenarios. Um, scenarios. One adv advantage of scenarios is they bring everybody on board. So unlike complex technological models, which only engineers and scientists can think about, anybody, um, ordinary people. Uh, uh, narrative writers, journalists, artists, anybody can think about scenarios. And I came across this quote from the novelist John Barth in, in Sunday's uh, uh, New York Times. He was talking about plot, and he said, plot is the gradual perturbation of an unstable homeostatic system and its catastrophic restoration to a new and complexified <laughs> equilibrium. <laughs> That is the most concise statement of the back loop I have ever found. And he probably never knew what a back loop was, but, uh, but he knew a lot about back loops, and he organized his novels around them. So it's easy to write stories about back loops, and that's one reason that, uh, that, that scenarios are a good way to go. Our, our first scenario project was in uh, the Northern Highland of Wisconsin. The Northern Highland is the uh, ceded territory. It's the uh, part of Wisconsin that was uh, that is managed, co-managed by uh, uh, Native peoples' uh, treaty rights and by the state agency. It's largely recreational, second-growth forest, thousands of lakes, one of the highest concentrations of lakes in in the world, and uh, the economy is uh, uh, largely recreation and forestry, and the economy is chronically in trouble, and it's an area with that has a tremendous amount of conflict uh, over resource management. And so we organized a series of uh, workshops up there uh, to, uh, 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 you know, to think about the back loop that the region seemed to chronically be in. And our approach at that time uh, was, was uh, really brought in modeling in the early phases. And so we developed a very complex model of the dynamics of the uh, uh, Northern Highland, which uh, had forest management, it had uh, lakeshore zoning and lakeshore management, it had uh, fisheries in it, it had hunting, it had several dimensions of the economy, and it had a rudimentary uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, social interaction uh, uh, in it. And, the, and it was set up as a game so that uh, uh, it could be managed by, a, uh, uh, by setting various levers in the game that uh, ran the computer program. So you could get a group of people around this computer program, say a, a, a realtor, a member of the Chamber of Commerce, a, a fishing guide, uh, somebody who owned a, um, a, a resort. Um, uh, a scientist, what, you know, whatever you could find, and they would manage the thing together. And, uh, and by observing that and working with them, we saw how people fought their way through computer-generated back loops. And, uh, the, and the model had certain fragilities in it, so you could uh, enter a pretty catastrophic back loop in 10 or 15 minutes if, if you weren't super careful in, in the way you, you uh, uh, manage the thing. And you could play a full cycle in half an hour or so. So in a 
two hour <laughs> workshop, you could go through many cycles of learning and uh, the individuals around the table could talk about uh, uh, what was going on with, with the system. So essentially it was a way to do adaptive management with a computer program uh, and it's a cheap experiment because you haven't wrecked anything. You know, the worst that's going to happen is you have to reboot the computer. So here, here's an example of four. Each color is a different uh, cycle uh, of, uh, uh, of a game that was actually played by a group of people in the Northern Highland. And, and we collected a, uh, uh, a bunch of these. I just want to very quickly mention uh, there's a book uh, uh, called Resilience Thinking and, and a later book called Resilience Practice by uh, Brian Walker and David Salt that are full of case studies of uh, applied resilience thinking in different regions around the world. The Northern Highland of Wisconsin is one of the case studies in uh, uh, the Resilience Thinking book. Um, about uh, uh, about the same time we were doing that Wisconsin project, I got dragged away into co-chairing the Scenarios Project for the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which essentially took all my time for about five years and is a huge exercise in uh, scenario thinking, which I'm not going to talk about today but I, I'd be happy to talk about it off, offline. But it is another model of that kind of approach, in this case, a global one. Um, I, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about this new synthesis by the Rays, the Resilience Alliance Young Scholars, because I, I think it might be useful uh, uh, to you in your thinking. So this uh, uh, project developed uh, uh, as, as uh, work by about a dozen young people who went through their graduate student and postdoc hood uh, working on this book as a side project. Uh, the leaders are um, uh, Wincy Biggs, who's one of my former grad students who now runs a complex systems institute in South Africa. Uh, uh, Maya Schluter, who is a postdoc with Simon Levin in the middle, who is uh, an environmental economist at the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics now, and uh, Michael Schoon uh, on the bottom, who's a political scientist at, uh, at Arizona State. And they um, develop uh, seven, I think it's seven, uh, principles for building resilience in social ecological systems, and I'm going to go quickly uh, uh, through those I should have mentioned. Uh, there's, you can read the whole book, which is very easy reading, or if you need the Reader's Digest condensed version, there is a paper uh, in Aries that, that uh, you, you can read pretty quickly. So uh, the first point is maintain uh, heterogeneity, uh, and uh, this is a you know, fairly familiar argument in ecology related to uh, the role of diversity, and uh, I, uh, I believe it's also fairly common in, uh, in, in the social sciences uh, as, as, as well. Uh, heterogeneity is guaranteed to improve resilience under uh, certain mathematical conditions in uh, nonlinear systems, according to a recent book by Scott Page. Um, manage connectivity, and you can't just say uh, make connectivity high or make connectivity low because epidemics spread through connectivity and fires spread through connectivity, uh, but also uh, good things like beneficial species and good ideas spread through connectivity. So um, there, uh, uh, the uh, correct level of connectivity or appropriate level is continually changing and it's different for different things. So you just have to be thinking about it. Um, slow variables, uh, the uh, many environmental problems are actually the result of ignoring slow change that then leads to catastrophic unexpected uh, uh, effects and there are slow variables in uh, societies as, as well because slow variables are not on the surface and not always apparent. It's important, and they don't change very much, so they look boring. It's important, that's what slow means, it's important to recognize they're there and, uh, and bring them to the surface when you are thinking about how a system works. Foster complex adaptive systems thinking, that's exactly what uh, this immersion program is doing and, and what we'll be doing uh, the, next, the next few days.
Uh, encourage learning. It's, um, uh, you know, the thing is, just about the time you think you understand how an ecosystem works, it doesn't work that way anymore. And uh, the same may be true of, of social systems. We'll hear from, from the experts uh, uh, shortly. But because knowledge is always partial and incomplete and the system is always changing, you've always got to be probing uh, to, to learn. And, and that's always got to be on the agenda. You're never done learning. Broaden participation. This is um, related to heterogeneity, but this is an explicitly social point that you need to build relationships and trust among key actors in the system in order for the system to function um, uh, uh, effectively. And uh, that, that involves broadening uh, participation and, and doing the best you can there. And uh, the final one is promoting polycentric government governance, which I, I've actually read that chapter twice and I don't understand it. And um, so I'm gonna hope that somebody else talks about that. Um, and I, I, I think somebody might. But it's in the book anyway. If you wanna read about it, go ahead. Field testing ideas uh, about, uh, about resilience. Um, I, I'm moving toward a wrap up here. Um, I have, uh, about 20 years ago, I published a paper saying, look, there are four ways to learn about ecosystems. And uh, they're uh, theory and models, long-term observation, experiments, and comparative studies of ecosystems. And in fact, our most robust concepts about ecosystems are the ones that are supported by all four legs of the table. So the, the really strong knowledge in ecosystem science is, is supported by those four methods. And as a conjecture, I would suggest that the same is true for social ecological systems. And there's certainly a, a lot of theory and models for social ecological systems. There are lots of longitudinal observations, observations of a social ecological system for a long period of time. There are a lot of comparative studies, uh, comparisons of different societies in the way that they have interacted with their environments. Experiments are not quite the same as what uh, an ecosystem scientist means by experiment. By, when I think about a lake experiment, I think about going in and ripping out a trophic level, or going in and stocking a new species, or changing the chemical composition of the water. And you can do that. But you can't go into a society and uh, just remove a socioeconomic socio group, for, for example. I mean, you just. Yeah, but it's not, it's not, it's not pretty. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you, but nonetheless, I think you can learn a lot from perturbations that will occur in social ecological systems that are just going to happen if you're watching and you have the right controls in place when a perturbation uh, occurs. I'm, um, this is one of my favorite quotes from one of the papers that influenced me the most as a graduate student. To find out what happens to a system when you interfere with it, you have to interfere with it. It's not enough to just sit there and, and watch it. Uh, and so tomorrow, I'm going to talk uh, uh, with you about a complex systems interference project that we're running now in the Hara watershed around Madison, Wisconsin, uh, where we are uh, uh, developing an assessment of ecosystem services that's actually designed to change the way people think about how the watershed works. And I'm going to say more about that tomorrow. So I'll just point out that it has a lot of boxes and arrow diagrams. And we did a lot of complicated stuff that I'll tell you about tomorrow. And now I'm going to give you a quick summary. So I've said a lot. And I've covered 20 years of uh, my learning and, 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 and uh, 20 years of research by a lot of people at a very uh, superficial level. But I, I'd like to draw out a few 
points that, I, that I'd like to make sure you take home. One is routine expansion versus turbulent change is a key distinction. That's the basic idea of the adaptive cycle and in my view the most important idea of the adaptive cycle. Both of these occur at the same time and at different scales and that gives managers and scientists opportunities. It gives managers opportunities to intervene and scientists opportunities to understand by paying attention to what's going on at, uh, at different scales. The back loop is the part of the adaptive cycle that we understand the least and it's highly influential and I think that is uh, an area that needs a lot of research attention. Um, we found a number of ways to accelerate thinking about back loops and long-term change. Uh, scenarios are one of those that I mentioned. Computer games are another. Uh, because you can do experiments very quickly uh, on computer games. And uh, I didn't talk uh, 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 very much about other kinds of games, but there's a big effort going on right now through the Stockholm Resilience Center to develop uh, role-playing games and interactive games uh, for uh, thinking about back loops very rapidly in, uh, in, in groups of people. And I mentioned models. Um, uh, engagement of researchers with the people who live in the social ecological system is essential. I can't think of any other way to do it because they know more than you do uh, about the system and you've You've just got to work with them. And currently, uh, it seems like the raised seven principles uh, in that book and that paper are providing a framework for organizing social ecological research that a lot of people are getting excited about. And um, even though I was not involved in that book, I, I wanted to uh, mention it to you as something for your consideration. Thanks very much.